welcome everyone to the third event in our World Water Week of events. Um, we're delighted to have you joining us and we're very delighted to have um, uh, an exciting presentation coming up from Professor Krista Keller, who I have the great pleasure of introducing. So Krista is a professor of comparative hydrology, urban hydrology and hydraulic mo hydrologic modeling at the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Syracuse University. Uh, Krista's research utilizes computational simulations of models ranging from simple conceptual representations to fully distributed and physically based frameworks, um, all brought together to interrogate the relationships between water quality and quantity and how this varies across landscapes. Um, she has received awards for her teaching excellence and accolades for her research publications, such as the Editor's Choice Award um, in 2019 for her paper on using tracer information and model framework trade-offs to improve estimation of stream transient storage processes. So that was um, just a very brief introdu introduction to, to Krista. And now I guess if Krista wants to share her slides, I am happy to hand the floor to Krista. And while she's doing that, I will just very briefly mention that we have, um, we're doing a survey of people, how people value water. So I will be sharing that in the, in the chat. And I would invite you all to write your questions in the Q&A so that we will address them, that Krista can address them then after her presentation. So over to you, Krista, and we're really excited to have you. And thank you so much for joining us for World Water Week. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. Today, I'm going to be talking about the pathways of water through urban landscapes. And in particular, when I think about uh, cities, I think about really two end member states. I think about what happens when it's very warm. Uh, we, we know that urban areas act as heat islands. Uh, when it's dry, when it's hot, uh, heat processes take over and uh, urban heat island will drive large differences in air temperature between inner city areas and rural edges. Urban areas absorb, absorb and hold heat much more than uh, rural edges where we tend to have a lot more vegetation. But this, this sort of end member state is not what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, I'm going to talk to you about cities during wet periods. Uh, so when it's wet, uh, when water is abundant and falling from the sky, where does that water go and how do we ensure that the pathways this water takes does not cause problems along the way? We have reasons to be worried about too much water in cities, right? When we have an abundance of impervious surfaces in urban areas, that's going to move water basically every which way, uh, meaning that we can create flooding in terms of both fluvial flooding associated with rivers sort of spilling over their banks, um, and pluvial flooding when the rate of precipitation exceeds the rate of infiltration and engineered drainage. Uh, this runoff, when it makes its way to storm sewers, as you can see on the bottom of this graphic, uh, is going to deliver a uh, that storm sewer water either directly to streams, if we're in a municipal separate stormwater system, or uh, when we have uh, too much water, uh, if you're in a combined sewer system, that storm water is going to combine with sewage and will cause overflows, again, delivering sewage to uh, river channels. So obviously too much water is not really a good thing. How do we get too much water? Is sort of the question that we're asking today. Um, the main problem that we're facing in the US is that our water infrastructure is really poorly degraded. The American Society of Civil Engineers regularly gives us a grade of D plus or D shown here for our stormwater infrastructure. Um, as climate warms, this water infrastructure will not only need to move more water, but it's likely that where I live in the Northeastern US and a lot of the results I'll show uh, for you here today, uh, the precipitation intensity will increase and storm duration will decrease meaning that we're going to get more intense events that are happening over shorter periods of time. Um, these two conditions are likely to challenge our water infrastructure and to pose problems for flooding and downstream water quality alike. Um, but with all of it, the devil is, is truly within the details and those details are, are what I wanna talk about. So how does water move through urban areas? Today, uh, this is a really great graphic from the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District. And um, I thought it sort of summarized the way that I think about how water interacts with urban areas. Um, in particular, today I'm gonna to talk about um, green spaces in cities, parks, lawns. I'm gonna talk a little bit about houses. So how do houses move water? Um, I'm gonna talk about runoff and flooding, a little bit about stormwater. Um, and then at, 
a bit at the end because I am a physical hydrologist and I think a lot about streams and rivers. Um, I'm going to tell you about some of the cool work that's challenging the way we think about how water moves um, in rivers uh, and streams in the urban continuum. So today I'm going to take you to a couple of different places. Um, this is a great map produced by NASA and uh, what it's showing you is impervious surfaces across the U.S. So for the past couple years, we've been thinking about questions of too much water um, and what this means for rivers and downstream water quality in a couple of different cities. I'm gonna take you first to New York City and to Baltimore, um, and then I'll follow up and finish with um, a brief visit to Syracuse and then to Buffalo, which um, in American uh, is, is about a short, we'll say two hour drive to the west of where I live in Syracuse. Um, understanding how water moves in cities is challenging. There's a lot of things that we don't really know um, and a lot of things that we tend to oversimplify. So at the surface, we reshape green spaces and rivers. We install green infrastructure, which is meant to sort of hold back water and allow it to slowly infiltrate um, as an alternative to the massive amounts of impervious surfaces we have across cities. Um, we reshape river channels. We straighten them, we line them with concrete, uh, in a goal to basically move water downstream as quickly as possible and to alleviate flooding. Um, in addition, we uh, modify connectivity and distribution of impervious surfaces. Um, we dig up our impervious surfaces, we put in new ones, um, and all of this is sort of happening through time. In the subsurface, uh, all of our the construction and modification of the urban environment means that um, our soil properties are largely unknown. We don't know what urban soil is, and I'll spend a little bit of time talking about that today. Um, and finally, the thing that I'm not going to talk as much about, but I do want to acknowledge, is that we intensely replumb the subsurface. So we put storm sewers, um, as well as other pipes and conduits in the subsurface. And these areas, right, they're not only carrying water and can leak, um, potentially supplying water to streams and to uh, the water table, um, but they also are surrounded by um, often coarser material that can act as sort of urban karst, uh, moving water very quickly associated with these conduits. Uh, finally, all of these processes, right, the important thing to think about is all of these processes are changing through time. Um, so none of these things in cities are static, which makes it quite hard to think about um, how these different properties and, and uh, interspersion of pervious and impervious surfaces are going to shape how water moves. So uh, flooding and stormwater, which are sort of our two most common challenges we contend with in cities, are really created by the interactions and interspersions of pervious and impervious surfaces. Um, in urban areas, stormwater, which really drives deleterious downstream water quality, is tied to runoff generation. Um, when I think about runoff generation, I think about sort of my training as a catchment hydrologist. We have sort of these two end member uh, types of runoff generation. I'll bet there's, there's many different ways that runoff can be generated. Um, but the two that, that are sort of our bread and butter are infiltration excess overland flow and saturation excess overland flow. Saturation excess overland flow is what predominates in sort of forested and humid situations, right? You have a lot of water, a lot of rainfall. Um, that is going to saturate your subsurface, and then runoff is essentially created uh, because that water falling from the sky has nowhere to go. But the more common mechanism that occurs in urban systems is infiltration excess overland flow. Um, this happens when the rate of precipitation exceeds the rate at which a surface can infiltrate, um, producing runoff. Uh, this is also the primary driver of what we call pluvial flooding. So I have some, some great examples of pluvial flooding from the UK as well as from the US. And this is sort of the, the very extreme end of what we consider to be uh, very scary and very harmful uh, pluvial flooding. Uh, events during which towns sustain incredible economic damages and individuals have, have lost lives. I'm showing you a couple of images from Ellicott City in Maryland and the city of Hull in the UK. Um, so this is, this is sort of one extreme, right? But these events are often um, uh, talked about in the news and, and we talk about them in presentations like this because they're often um, very infrequently occurring. Uh, so the good news is when something bad like this happens, there's a good chance it's not going to happen again for a while. Um, 
These events often occur infrequently that they strike without warning and they, they really set up this problem for how do we study um, and identify areas at risk from flooding beyond just the floodplain. What you see here, right, of course, is, is now the entire area outside of the floodplain is flooded. How does that happen and how do we study it? So our approach that we have been using <clears throat> is to use parsimonious models and parsimonious computations um, at a scale that's relevant to humans. So we focus on really high resolution information using um, high resolution digital elevation models um, and use that information to try to identify places in the landscape that might be more susceptible to infiltration excess overland flow, poor drainage, and therefore flooding. Um, we have a lot of definitions around the world for what constitutes sort of a small or a large flood, but I really like this graphic from Muktafari et al. Um, that is really about uh, small scale and low depth flooding. And what they show us, right, is that uh, depth plotted here on the y axis, even just a couple centimeters of water can really cause problems in cities. Um, if you think about the last time you drove to work in a major flood, when we have ponding in our roads, that's going to slow down traffic might cause traffic accidents. And in addition, because those types of low level flooding um, are happening more often, there's sort of a constant drain on things that happen within cities. So these small scale events um, are potentially the key to thinking about what might happen under very extreme scenarios. So we've been uh, coming at this question of what, aerial, what areas are most susceptible for pluvial flooding. Um, using uh, publicly available information from citizen science reports, excuse me, and um, high resolution digital elevation models. So while riverine flooding can really be studied using stream gauges or stream flow information, we need information sources that are a little bit different to think about pluvial flooding. Um, to study these small floods, we use uh, information service 311 reports which exist in a lot of major cities in the US, Baltimore and New York City are the two cities that I'm gonna tell you a little bit about today. Um, and to link those flood reports to something predictive, we've been using these high resolution digital elevation models that commonly exist in cities. Um, we are using approximately one meter resolution digital elevation models um, in these two cities. And uh, I'll show you a little bit later some results from Syracuse where we're, we have a similar resolution of information. So uh, one of the things that we did, and this work uh, really was in collaboration with um, Lauren McPhillips, who's a professor at Penn State. Lauren had this great idea. Uh, everybody in sort of forested catchments uses uh, topographic indices to explain where high soil moisture occurs. Can we do the same thing in urban areas? So using high resolution digital elevation models, we, we attempted sort of a proof of concept to test the predictive power of two topographic indices. Uh, the topographic wetness index, which is incorporating sort of the area that you have draining to a single point and the slope of the land at that point um, and uh, sink depths. If you've ever delineated a watershed in um, any sort of geospatial programming software, what you probably had to do at some stage is quote unquote, fill your sinks. Um, oftentimes we treat sinks, which are basically low depressions where all of the cells surrounding a single cell in the middle are, um, are higher, sort of creating this little bowl um, in the landscape. Uh, those areas uh, we treat as artifacts, but our thought was when it comes to sort of thinking about places that are going to flood, um, are these areas actually potentially telling us something that could be relevant to thinking about flooding? Um, you'll notice sort of in the middle two different examples of what those topographic indices look like, and you'll see sort of this weird checkerboard pattern. Um, this is because it's challenging to treat buildings um, in urban digital elevation models. So for the purposes of our analyses, uh, we uh, only looked at areas that consisted of impervious surfaces like sidewalk and roads, um, along with pervious areas, parks, uh, vegetated surfaces, and canopy cover. So we excluded buildings. Um, depending on the type of digital elevation model that you're working with in a city, oftentimes cities will sort of remove the buildings and again, create a little bowl, create a little local depression where the building would be. 
So for the purposes of our analysis, that wouldn't be so good because everything would just sort of drain to that point. So we exclude buildings from this. Um, I'll bet acknowledging that, that roofs are gonna have um, probably some fundamental uh, controls on how water moves from the surface uh, into the rest of the urban scape. And then the question really was, if we calculate these topographic indices um, across cities, how do we link them to locations of flood reports? So I'm showing you sort of one of the interactive reports that you can make in New York City's 311 service. And you'll see this little dot sort of in the center, purple, um, showing you how you would report a flood, um, street flood in New York City. And so what you would do is they ask you a couple of questions. They say, is it raining? Do you notice if, if there's a storm drain close by? Is there debris in the storm drain? Because of course they're interested in sort of figuring out what about the infrastructure isn't working? Um, but then on top of that, they ask you to identify a location. And so as part of that location identification process, you have to supply an address. Um, and oftentimes uh, when you're sort of placing that bubble, you can, you can move it around a little bit, but it's gonna be snapped to the stream center line. So sort of our recognition in terms of how do we match up the spatial information with our reports of flooding from 311, um, was recognizing that the locations of those reports are going to be a little bit uncertain. So when we combined our flood reports, shown here with sort of red little circles, um, with those topographic indices, um, we extracted information in two different ways. We pulled out both sort of a local, what is the cell exactly underneath where the flooding report occurs, um, and we used a window um, of about 10 meters by 10 meters around each of those flooding locations and extracted the maximum topographic wetness index or the maximum sink depth. Um, for the purposes of brevity today, I'm just gonna show you results for topographic wetness index and tell you a little bit about how we're sort of carrying forward the results with sinks in Syracuse. So we did this for a couple of different watersheds. And I say that with, with like big quotation marks around it because what is an urban watershed? We have sewer sheds, we have watersheds. How water moves in the subsurface is very different than how water moves um, at the surface in these urban areas. Um, and we sort of did this, created these smaller areas as a way to sort of reduce the computational burden for this proof of concept demonstration. Um, we pulled out two different areas in Staten Island. The red numbers are showing you the percentage of developed land cover. Um, we pulled out four different areas um, in Manhattan and I'm gonna just show you two of those today. And then we pulled out two different watersheds um, in Baltimore. Uh, Baltimore uh, is served by a um, MS4 system, a municipal separated stormwater system, as is parts of Staten Island. Um, Manhattan is served by a combined sewer system. So a little bit of variation in, in how these different areas are managed. Staten Island is actually a really interesting study in how to manage stormwater. Uh, they have this crazy thing called the Blue Belt, this large-scale system of stormwater best management practices, the green infrastructure, and all these crazy things. We won't talk about that today. So one of the first questions we, we had, and something that we wanted to correct for and ensure we were taking into account, um, is that uh, flooding, right, if you're reporting flooding, it might just be because of broken infrastructure, right? Water mains break all the time. We had one break a month or two ago here in Syracuse. They're always... Um, going, especially in winter months. So one of the things that we did was look through our flooding reports to make sure that they were occurring at times when uh, rain was falling as sort of a first check on, are we measuring broken infrastructure or are we measuring something else? And I'm showing you here two different time series, uh, count of flood incidents for both New York City on the bottom and Baltimore on the top. And I'm showing you um, also precipitation for each of those two different areas. And I've sort of called out different major events that have happened. So New York City, Irene generated a lot of rainfall. Sandy was much more wind than rainfall. Um, and uh, this is sort of our record and our, and our way to say, um, is it rain or is it infrastructure? Recognizing we can't fully answer that question, but we can sort of be careful about thinking about this. And now I'm going to jump into showing you a couple of different results. First, I'm going to show you distributions of whole watershed topographic wetness index, uh, topographic wetness index immediately overlaying flood reports shown by TWI point in, in this lighter gray, 
And then in white, maximum TWI in the vicinity of the flood report shown with this distribution in white. So I'm going to add a couple more watersheds to this, a couple more subplots, and show you results for Manhattan, Staten Island, and Baltimore. Sorry, a little fuzzy there. Um, and our observations were that nuisance flooding reports often, though not always, um, immediately overlaid areas with high topographic wetness index. Uh, the second observation that we had is basically if we assume that those flood report locations are uncertain, and we assume that the location of a maximum topographic wetness index somewhere close to that nuisance flooding report location is probably where that flood is happening. Um, we find that most of those locations where we have flood reports also coincide with um, or are proximal to areas with high topographic wetness index. So this sort of told us that, that maybe we're onto something and maybe there's um, something to this analysis, but we didn't really feel like we were comparing apples with apples um, when we compare sort of the whole watershed to just a couple of points. So we used another approach where we generated random samples of topographic wetness index from across each of those different watershed areas. Uh, we generated those random samples 100 different times, 100 different exceedance probabilities. Um, and we plotted them as exceedance probabilities, as you see here, uh, compared to exceedance probabilities of topographic wetness index immediately at that flood report location. Um, and also as compared to sort of the maximum value uh, around that flood report location. The other thing that we did, the bluer colors, um, are just reports that occurred in summer. Again, taking into account the fact that if we have broken water mains or if we have other problems, um, those are more likely to occur in colder months. Whereas in summer, where a lot of our precipitation is driven by these convective storms, dumping large amounts, large amounts of water onto the urban landscape, that's potentially our time when we are more likely to observe pluvial flooding. So again, I'm going to sort of build this up and we see that sort of those topographic wetness index values at a point as compared to our randomly sampled distribution shown in gray um, are actually quite similar. And I think, I think that's okay, right? Because we expect that some of our random samples across each watershed are probably going to co coincide with places that would experience flooding. But again, if we look at sort of those maximum sampling points, those places where we assume that our report location is uncertain, we see that those areas are all really proximal to high topographic wetness index values. So this was sort of proof of concept. It was published very early in 2019, and we've been following up on it in a couple of different ways. Um, first, I do want to acknowledge, right, there's a lot of assumptions and uncertainties, and that means there's lots of opportunities for future work. Um, in particular, we don't know much about the subsurface, and we're still thinking about how best to sort of incorporate the subsurface into analyses like this. Um, New York City has actually just recently created an open sewer atlas, which is sort of giving us new information about the subsurface. A lot of cities still sort of treat that information as proprietary and, and really related to safety. Um, so they don't release that information. Or if they're a city like Syracuse, they may just not be collecting that information. So we don't really know where the catch basins are, or where the storm sewers are, and if they're working. Um, I'm only showing you sort of results for topographic wetness index, and it might not be topographic wetness index or sink depths. It might be sort of both happening in different landscape positions, which is something we explored a little bit and actually showed some promise. Um, and there are also probably plenty of places with deep sinks or high topographic wetness index where reports are absent for a variety of reasons. We know that areas that are going to be reported via 311 are going to be places where people are walking, places where people frequent. Um, we also know that the areas where people make reports is going to be segmented by socioeconomic status. So areas of higher socioeconomic status are going to have the time to um, go ahead and report those flooding locations. And then finally, right, not all of these flood reports are likely created equal. We don't know the depth or the extent of those reported flooding. So one way uh, that we're starting to get at this, and I just want to give a shout out as part of my talk today to a couple uh, different people who are doing really cool work in this sphere. One is Aditi Baskar, who has uh, created the Flood Tracker app. 
which you can download if you're somebody like me who walks around cities and, and uh, thinks too much about where water goes or why the storm drain might be blocked. Um, I encourage you to download this app and take some information. One of the cool things that Aditi has created into her app is that you can take photos to accompany um, your reported uh, flooding locations. So with those photos, we potentially have a little bit more information that can allow us to sort of interpret um, what flooding means to different people. In terms of sinks um, in Syracuse, we're starting to make those sinks move using a very simple model, uh, the arc Malmstrom model created by Ballstrom and Crawford, uh, which takes uniform rainfall uh, and uses a one-dimensional screening method that has a very fast runtime, but neglects a lot of subsurface processes and entirely assumes infiltration excess overland flow dominates. And we're applying that to Syracuse to generate uh, the output from this model, which are called blue spots. They're essentially little sinks um, that occur in the landscape. Ballstrom and Crawford have gone from saying each sink is sort of um, not connected to allowing those sinks to move and allowing those sinks to sort of be routed through the urban area. In Syracuse, we're using a very extreme event. We're using a one hour, 100 year storm, which is about six centimeters. So it is assuming a real strong upper bound. But again, it lets us start to think about what places might be at risk from flooding and do these areas have um, good amounts of stormwater infrastructure to move that water out of those areas. So I just want to show you some brief examples. This work is being done by one of my master's students, Ingrid Marquez. Um, and Ingrid here is showing you the blue spot depths on the left, anywhere between 3.3 centimeters, which is sort of our vertical DEM accuracy. Anything below that, we say uh, we have no way to know if that is an actual blue spot or not. Um, and she's comparing them to a couple different sources of information. She's comparing them to information that we have from Syracuse's city line, where people will report large floods. Um, and she's also comparing them to news reports. So here you can see each of these little red triangles is a place where Ingrid was able to match up uh, a photo from a news report with an actual location in Syracuse. And from this, we're sort of seeing, right, that those places tend to have deep blue spots. They tend to be places um, that our model would say are at risk for extreme flooding. Uh, one of the other things that Ingrid is doing is actually going out to these blue spots and mapping stormwaters, uh, stormwater sewers in these locations, shown in red. Um, and we're sort of using our local knowledge in these places to augment um, what the model is telling us. So if we know that um, an area has a blue spot but a lot of storm sewers, that sort of tells us that should be a place that drains pretty well. Um, in Syracuse, folks can also report when their catch basin gets clogged. So we're also sort of able to take that information into account now and say, all right, if you've got a blue spot and a lot of uh, potential clogging, that's a place where more maintenance is needed and maybe we need to think about um, redesigning the topography in that area in some way to reshape how water moves around those different places. Um, in Syracuse, we get a lot of situations like the one on the top right, uh, which is located very near to where I live, um, basically eight stormwater sewers all surrounding uh, a single place, that area still floods. <laughs> so having uh, sewer information can also sort of let you think about um, where the problems may be and uh, if those stormwater sewers are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, when we think about flooding, I think we need both sort of bottom-up approaches like the ones that I'm talking about here, but also top-down approaches like the work that's being done by the First Street uh, foundation uh, to really predict flooding at very high resolution across the entire U.S. Um, those top-down approaches let us start to interrogate what we know about flood risk and communities that may be um, at higher risk of flooding um, in terms of environmental justice and equity issues. I'm showing you on the right a map of a redlined uh, Sacramento, California. Uh, redlining was a, a deeply racist practice engaged in in the early 1930s, supported by the U.S. government, that basically denied mortgages to mostly people of color living in urban areas, preventing them from purchasing homes, for funding renovations or improvements. Um, and those maps of redlined areas exist for most metropolitan areas in the U.S. Um, 
what uh, Redfin, a Seattle-based real estate brokerage, is doing with this First Street Foundation model and recently released this week is they are taking that flood information and comparing areas with a high grade of A and B with areas that have been redlined, grades of C or D. And what they're finding is there are many different cities across the US where uh, folks that live in those redlined areas now are at greater risk of high flood um, uh, potential problems. So this sort of lets us know that we need to think about things um, from the top down because that can potentially identify um, places where, where there is undue risk being placed on certain populations. But roads are just one part of the urban continuum. Here is a view from the top of Syracuse. When you look at this, you probably see the green spaces, the parks, but the thing that, that jumps out at me is all the houses. So houses are places where we have impervious surface, impervious surface in really close proximity. Um, making it hard for us to determine if these areas are going to infiltrate precipitation or produce runoff. Um, I do want to share some really cool work that has thought about this from Carolyn Voter, who's a, a, a researcher at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, um, in the vein of sort of giving shout outs about cool work. Um, Carolyn went after this question of do residential par parcels generate runoff using an integrated um, watershed model called Parfloat CLM. And one of the coolest things she did is she uh, simulated runoff with this model and then introduced various, um, various interventions that you can do on, on um, residential parcels, adding microtopography, disconnecting a downspout, and, and uh, directing it towards an area of extensive green space, um, disconnecting sidewalks, um, and you can see sort of her model on the right of a typical parcel having about 25% imperviousness. And two things that Carolyn showed us that I think are really cool. One is that there are things that all of us can do to reduce runoff from um, our properties. The main one being, right, disconnect that downspout. If you have gutters that are going to route water in some way, uh, often down sort of off your property, make sure that you are connecting that downspout to a green space. Uh, the main thing that Carolyn found, the thing that I, I think is especially exciting, um, though, is that soil really matters. Uh, soil properties on these residential parcels, parcels is what is going to determine how and where water moves. Um, so a quick shout out to Boromir, who um, is telling us that one does not simply call soil dirt. Soil is a lot of different things. Um, but in urban areas, uh, our current soil information is atrocious. Uh, it's incomplete, outdated, or non-existent, a quote from the NRCS, sort of our, our uh, generators of soil information in the U.S. I'm showing you here a map of different um, soil uh, across Syracuse, and you'll see in the middle this big gray blob. That is a single soil type called urban soil that the NRCS uses anytime we have um, a soil that we recognize humans have intensely reshaped in some way, and we just acknowledge we know nothing about it. We know nothing about what it's going to do. So there's lots of cool work happening in urban soils right now. Um, work by Dustin Herman, Laura Schiffman, and Bill Schuster is showing that urban soil profiles um, are different than profiles that are outside of urban areas. Uh, reference soils here on this graph are shown in red, and urban soils are shown in blue. And what they found is that urban so pro soil profiles are simpler than soil profiles outside of the city. Uh, they synthesize an incredible number of cores, um, 181 cores from reference soils and 332 cores from urban soils across 11 different cities. And what they find is the B horizon um, isn't there. It's largely non-existent. And you can sort of see that looking at this graph here in the middle that's telling you the probability of occurrence for different soil layers. Um, there's some implications for that. Uh, it probably depends on a lot where you are. The absence of a B horizon can impact rooting zone depth, nutrient cycling, um, but B horizons are also places where we can have low permeability uh, layering. And so the absence of a B horizon in some places could be really good or could be really bad. We don't really know the implications quite yet. But what this does sort of emphasize to us is that humans reshape landscapes and they reshape soils. 
Um, one particular area in the landscape where uh, unknown soil properties are especially interesting um, is places in the city that undergo a lot of transformation and heavy machinery. You're probably wondering why you're seeing a lot of uh, really sad looking houses. These are um, abandoned homes from Detroit, uh, which is something that you will see if you go to any of the Rust Belt cities here in the US, Syracuse, Buffalo, um, all of these cities basically as their um, manufacturing core has declined, people have moved out of the city. Um, they've left behind sort of these abandoned homes that have become uh, problems for crime. And so most cities have decided to tear them down. As they've teared them down though, um, what they've done is they've created what we refer to as vacant lots. And uh, vacant lots are an interesting place, right? They're, they're places where we're basically taking impervious surfaces and removing them um, and making them pervious again. Uh, but they're also places where we brought in lots of heavy machinery um, and it potentially compacted the soils um, and brought in new fill to fill in areas left behind debris. So you can sort of see on the bottom uh, graphic here. So the question that we've been asking is, are these areas um, potentially able to serve as a sink for stormwater? Are they able to infiltrate a lot of runoff um, and potentially uh, reduce runoff generation? Uh, this is work that we've done in Buffalo, and you can see on the right just the number of vacant parcels that exist across the city of Buffalo. It's really a tremendous amount of land. This work um, has been done in collaboration with the Buffalo Sewer Authority and two um, awesome people, a landscape architect, Sean Burkholder, um, and Bill Schuster. And what Sean and Bill did is they came up with this um, protocol for going out and assessing vacant lots. And they put this protocol on iPads and they gave it to a bunch of undergraduate and graduate students. And those undergraduate and graduate students went out and visited over 700 different parcels um, and took lots of information on these vacant lots. And I'm gonna tell you about some of the observations we have made from this really cool data set today. So here's a typical vacant parcel. Um, the first thing they assessed is because the demolition process when we remove a house is not always complete. Sometimes you leave behind impervious surfaces like you can see with sidewalks here. So they assessed land cover in each of sort of nine different um, squares across a parcel. Uh, they also assessed elevation, sort of standing from the middle and using a stadia rod to figure out what is the general shape of these vacant parcels. Um, and then finally, they uh, ran infiltration experiments using a mini disc infiltrometer, which is a way to rapidly assess unsaturated hydraulic conductivity, which we can sort of use as um, information about how quickly water is going to infiltrate at the land surface. They did that at two different places, um, one in sort of the center of the lot, a place where we would assume uh, there was a foundation and there was a lot of compaction, and in the backyard of the lot, in a place that we assume is potentially less impacted by that heavy machinery and intense uh, filling and refilling um, and movement of soils. So today I'm not going to show you those information, uh, those different infiltration rates separately, I'm going to average them together. And uh, what we found looking across these data sets is that these vacant lots really displayed a common structure. Um, they had infiltration rates that were log normally distributed. Uh, a couple of places where that infiltration rate was very, very low, nothing is going into the ground, but also plenty where that infiltration rate was a lot higher. Um, those lots were all generally pretty well vegetated, except for towards the front of the lot, where incomplete demolition might have left behind impervious surfaces. Um, and the lots were all very gently sloped towards the street at a gradient of about one to two um, percent. So not a lot of topography and mostly green and pervious. The average infiltration rates um, were not really spatially structured. Here I'm showing you the infiltration rates with confidence intervals associated with them. Um, and I'm showing you how these infiltration rates plotted across the city. Um, we have some areas of highs and lows, but general interspersion um, suggesting that you could be, uh, you could throw a stone and hit either a high or a low uh, infiltrating parcel. We compared these with demolition dates, thinking maybe uh, parcels that were demolished uh, longer ago would have higher infiltration rates as sort of vegetation came back. 
um, and didn't find any strong relationships. What we did do um, is run a very simple model to assess how much water becomes infiltration versus runoff on these areas for a one hour storm of varying magnitude. And uh, basically we assumed if there was impervious surface on a lot, it was going to generate runoff. Um, oftentimes that impervious surface was sort of disconnected from other green spaces. So this is probably um, overestimating runoff, but we wanted to sort of be careful and thoughtful um, and, and go for the worst case scenario. Uh, we applied this for hourly design storms um, and we assume free drainage as a lower boundary condition. So we're not taking into account antecedent moisture or evapotranspiration. Um, Buffalo, like Syracuse, is a place where we get a lot of snow. So this is sort of an idealized case for a warm season period only. Uh, during the winter, the soils are frozen. There's, there's snow everywhere. Obviously, those are going to be conditions that are going to produce a lot of runoff. So I want to take you through this plot, and I just want to orient you first. Um, on the top, I'm showing you the vacant land area associated with um, different rates of infiltration across these vacant lots. And um, in the middle, I'm showing you a plot of hourly rainfall rate on the y-axis versus those vacant lot infiltration rates on the x-axis. And color here is going to indicate the fraction infiltrated for different parcels with different infiltration rates. Um, and then also across all parcels uh, shown on the far right. So we're gonna add one, one layer here. So at a very, very, very low precipitation rate, um, what we would predict is unless a lot has any impervious surface, dark blue means that all of that precipitation is infiltrated. And you can see over here on the far right, that same information is being plotted for all parcels, 100% or near 100% infiltration. That holds, um, that fraction of precipitation estimated to infiltrate remains high across all of these lots um, for our most frequent rainfall rates, which tend to be very low. Um, so we're still infiltrating on the order of 90% of our precipitation for very low hourly rainfall rates. But as we sort of ratchet that up and add um, more infiltration, or excuse me, add higher rates of precipitation, right, we move to a situation where everything becomes runoff, as you would sort of expect. So what this sort of leads us to believe is that these vacant lots are, have potential to be a tool for sustainable stormwater management, but mainly when we're thinking about really low infiltration rates. Again, there's still a lot left to do. So we don't know how groundwater antecedent moisture will sort of in interact with these infiltration rates on these lots. We don't really know if we're reducing what is reaching sewers from these lots. We don't know if we're actually creating a groundwater contamination problem. If we're, we're making these areas able to infiltrate lots of water, um, given that they've been places of heavy construction, there might be things in the subsurface that um, could be causing a problem for later down the road. And finally, most of these vacant lots are in areas of lower socioeconomic status. If we keep them as sort of pervious areas and redevelop in other places, is that really fair when we think about equitable development across our cities? So more work is needed, but we do really think that these vacant lands can be potentially seen as sponges for lots of runoff. So finally, I just want to sort of step back. Um, the reason that we think so intensely about what happens in the, la the landscape of gradient of rivers is because downstream hydrology and water quality are going to really reflect what is happening upstream, the way that we're managing these landscapes. And in particular, um, there are a lot of uh, studies that are coming out now that are sort of challenging um, our common conceptions for how water moves in cities and how what is up gradient influences how rivers respond and how their water quality um, evolves through time. So in particular, we think of as we have watersheds with greater impervious surface cover, we're going to have more flooding. We're going to have higher flashiness, which is basically just a descriptor of the hydrograph and how quickly it rises and falls. Um, and we're going to have lower flows. But impervious surfaces, I really don't think sort of rule all. It's important to consider the details. 
So in particular, we know that this isn't going to be true in all um, different ecoregions across the US and around the world. Lauren McPhillips uh, recently showed that we get the opposite pattern that we would expect in arid areas. So when you're in a very dry place, um, flashiness is likely to um, be associated with watersheds that have less imperviousness, and flashiness will actually decrease as you add imperviousness. Um, on the right, work by Margaret Zimmer and Sarah Ledford has shown that low flow magnitudes um, from the a fun word, the Charlanta mega region, Atlanta all the way up to Washington, D.C., um, low flow magnitudes, hydrologic signatures that um, basically tell us about the magnitudes of low flow um, were not related to development. They were more closely related to sort of biophysical watershed factors. Um, low flow is a really interesting metric. Um, it's going to be influenced by sort of watershed processes, but also um, development and human activity. They also found that interannual variability in low flow signatures decreased with developed land cover. What that means is, as you move to more and more developed areas, they found that those low flow metrics were actually more stable. So low flow was more variable in areas that had more forested um, or pervious cover. So different ways that are sort of challenging how we think about how water moves in urban areas. Um, finally, it's really a great time to be working in cities. We have new exciting data sets that are telling us about the spatiotemporal uh, ways that cities form. We have um, new blueprints for water equity, like things being introduced by the U.S. Water Alliance. And we have tremendous amounts of citizen science that I think are going to yield new insights um, as we move forward. Uh, so finally, um, I just want to say thank you to you all for, for inviting me today. And, and thanks to um, everybody on the line for tuning in. Uh, and I would be very happy to take any questions that you have.